Welcome everyone. Um, this is a bit of a different one. It's kind of my database stuff. I've got an hour to myself. Everyone's gone out of the house. So I thought I'd put together something around my musings and thoughts on the games industry right now, which is quite pertinent in terms of where we are. Um, and just to caveat this, this is based on my long experience, almost 40 years now, I'm knocking on, um, in terms of working in the corporate business space. So I'm well aware of a lot of the things that happen in the games industry, both from a development aspect, because that's what I do, but also from the financial aspect, the commercial aspect, which is a big part of my role and has been over the years in various companies that I've worked for, both public and private sector, but specifically private sector, which is where most of this comes from. This is all really around the fact that you know, obviously there's a big shift in gaming at the moment in terms of where it's headed, what it's doing, and the shakeup is a lot of their own cause. The, the industry itself has done this to itself. And it's not about one particular thing. Um, and I'm not going to get into all of the politics and the reasons and wetfalls and all that kind of stuff. This is a more of a factual discussion around how things happen. There's never one reason. People always boil things down to single things. You know, like to put things in pigeonholes and say it's this, it's that, it's never that. So I'm going to cover a few areas um, and I'll caveat all the stuff at the end. So it really is around companies are kind of falling apart very quickly. New startups um, are falling apart. We've seen recently Deviation Games, um, long-standing companies as well, dwindling. The bastion of PlayStation UK in London Soho is also predominantly gone now, along with a total of 900 people at PlayStation. But it's not just PlayStation. It's not just one area. You know, over 1,600 people at Activision have gone. Over 1,000 at Microsoft are gone. Google is dropping people as well. Uh, other companies, Facebook, everyone's cutting. Um, it's all happening everywhere, and it's more than just the games industry. But I'll focus on that specifically here in this video. Um, and, and a little history lesson that I feel is important first, and apologies, but I think it's good. Context is good. I must stress I'm not a financial guru as well by any means. I'm not just claiming that I am. But I have a great deal of understanding of the way the market works, how companies work, investments, etc. And I've worked all of this before. I've having worked before, during and after the dot-com bubble in banks um, and other companies. So mine is real world experience and information. So nothing's generally different in the world. Everything works the same way. And I've said this before and I'll say it again. This whole issue in the games industry is the dot-com bubble 2.0 as far as I'm concerned. I know that's generalizing and I'll generalize a lot here and, I'll, and, and apologies, but it's the best way to try and get to the point I'm trying to make. So rich idiots never learn, okay? They, they repeat the same mistakes over and over again with wide-eyed wannabes always ever present within the industry. So people that know what they're doing get latched onto by people that have the money and that's how the world kind of works generally and that's specifically how gaming has grown to this level it's grown to so from approximately 1995 onwards um when it kind of grew to stupid levels in terms of the internet it was unrealistic and stupid target all those levels were based on the same problem since time began which is new technology with far too much exuberance and far too little knowledge cause issues then as now low interest rates relatively to five years earlier at that time made the borrowing of money good and venture capitalists which is the biggest reason all these things happen and remember venture capitalists are people that invest other people's money generally that's what they do so they rush in as always and they only want small to medium companies with huge growth potential that's the only thing they're interested in what do i get what's my return what's my capacity to get even more and greed always attracts greed these come as, as market offerings so basically ipo so initial public offerings is this is how this happens so a company starts off it gets to a level where it's making money and then they put it on the stock market so they make an ipo and this is when all the money comes in and this is where people get rich so this went on till the late 90s with the dot-com stuff and the whole house of cards fell in about 2000 and uh, trust me i know <laughs> A stand, I know. So due to the unrealistic market value of companies and little to no, well, I'd say none of them making profit, some did. That doesn't mean that individuals didn't get rich, mind. That always happens. That's a very different thing that people get confused with. Um, this left many companies gone overnight. And due to the increase in interest rates and kind of inflated market values of stock and all that kind of stuff in terms of what the market was really able to accept and what the companies were worth, all but a few of these companies were dissolved overnight. They were gone because there was no money. There was no capital. There was nothing left. It was standing on sand. 
Now this is exactly the same scenario as games and streaming is now, which is also falling into that regression, that consolidation path that happened back then as well. And games and studios have done exactly the same thing as the boom of the World Wide Web. Then, the new technology in the World Wide Web, along with more accessible technology in IBM compatibles, browsers in the, on the back of like Mosaic and Netscape, they pushed huge growth in the accessibility market. And it was a huge cash cow for some. Basically, they saw this opportunity to jump into this booming market that was going to make loads of money, uh, and games is exactly the same. So around 2016, gaming was at that growth level. It was growing across many sectors. It was growing into other markets. And then around 20, 2021, COVID and the lockdown bubble happened. And a captive market, along with those same and even lower interest rates, pushed the venture capitalists and IPOs to pop up everywhere. And yet again, a get rich or get richer quick plans are plenty. And this is where it always come from. And this creates the main problem, oversaturation of the market, excessive forecasting from so-called experts. Again, nothing new. The, the supply far outweigh the demand. And now the interest rates at the same time were at record lows. But since the start have now risen by over a thousand percent or higher. And thus makes borrowing far, far more expensive. And the quantitative of easing made by governments, which they've done over the last couple of years since COVID, i.e. this printing money, what this does is this devalues every dollar, every pound, every yen, every euro, everything in the market is worth less. Every dollar you own, every pound you have is worth less once this happens. In addition, the interest rates have now gone up, so borrowing is far more expensive and therefore risks become higher and therefore this is where you see where we are now. So these two factors alone would lead to a crash in the market. But we also have that same dot-com bubble effect, which is overinflated market values, bloated companies promising the moon on a stick and great returns, and two or three years of big, big failures. Late delivery, overspend, means the capital investment on all public trading companies rely on, every single one, and fundamentally for IPOs, has dried up. And it's become far too risky for anyone to invest. People are basically pulling their money. Many investors run through social governance and environmental scoring to validate if the money is going to be a cause they support or conform to. This is basically ESG funding, which many companies must adhere to, big and small. Don't get me wrong, this is not something that's new. But this money is going into the next big thing now, AI, leaving games last year's plaything and low return, high risk, i.e., no one wants to be involved with it again. So it's AKA the American video game market crash from 1982 to 87. A leper that venture capitalists are no longer giddy with and therefore they're pulling their funds, they're hedging their bets and they're, they're basically cutting their losses and taking their money elsewhere. This is what's happened. And this is what's happened across the board. And if you haven't got any money anymore, that you end up losing your business or you end up changing tact. And this is why you're seeing such a big area of Xbox and where it's going. Like I said before, 2017, I said this, that the Microsoft were heading out of the market. Their aim was never to keep the hardware in there. And that's why they, even they are affected by this. They will have lost investment, or at least they will be told where their money can go. And video games and consoles won't be their target now. Now, this is a simplification of epic proportions, and there's obviously more caveats that I've discussed in other episodes, such as the remote working culture, the culture in general, using contractors and relying on outsourcing work. But let's just take Deviation Games as a prime example. So ex-Activision employees leave the company and they set up a brand new one, IPO, remember, this is where we're at. And then they announced a new IP with PlayStation in 2021. And they track the exact dates of all of this, spun up in 2020, and we're only about one of 20 off the top of my head in the same or shorter period. So there was a lot of small companies being spun up very quickly in this time frame. Again, dot com. The market looked ripe and likely had the plan of work for self for a bit and get rich quicker by making a successful business and then selling it. And this is largely the same business models all these companies target at the start. Most successful companies aren't started by rich or wanting to be rich people. They're started by intelligent people. They just don't end up or stay in those hands. The main issue is the route to get there, the biggest hurdle is capital, which is where venture capitalists come in, or a bank, investment house, mum and dad. The fact is, you need to set up a business, you need money, you need premises, you need computers, software, power, people, accounts, payroll, you know, everything. 
before you even make a penny, you've got to put money in. Now, most startups start small and then grow over time. The adage of don't try and sell the car, sell the tires first and work upwards. That's really how businesses always used to start. Not anymore. Everything's fast track. So here, through experiencing game and networking, the owners of this company had a leg up. They basically knew a lot of people in the business and they went straight to Sony for a third party exclusive deal. And this was likely based on standard milestone and publishing agreements. Again, nothing new in this industry. They fund part of the spin-up cost and in return, they get fixed deliverables through the schedule of which the team must have been two years into that if they announced it in 2022 and started the company the year prior. They must have already had an idea what that plan was. Again, Nothing I'm saying here is fact and only based on my knowledge of similar things and also that the studio is going the same way. Now, the team most likely slipped on those deliverables, sadly, far too common in the current day. And in the end, Sony and other VCs, it won't just have been Sony, took the risk just like everyone does in these things. And they may have had other options along the way. You know, if it was really good, if it was looking great, we might take exclusivity, we might do a publishing deal with you. Things are not set in stone when things start. They, they set a groundwork and then you can have change requests going on down the line. And as the contract would have had exit clauses based on that as well, so slippages outside of any of those agreed CRs, then all parties have an option to change, adapt and react to things, you know, based on market impacts. What probably happened is PlayStation still have investors. And if the risk gets too high or simply the investment increases due to delays, i.e. if you delay, that costs money. Somebody's got to fund it. You know, that's another year's worth of development. That's going to cost money before you even make any money back. So you cut your losses. And this is likely the result. And this is what we're seeing. So this is an example of what we're seeing across the board. Big and small. I need to stress this. People think a big company is free from all these kind of risks. They're not. They're just, they have less of a risk if things happen, i.e. they don't go pop. Um, and as they had no capital of their own or likely other backers or insufficient backers to support this happening, they had to close the shop, which is why they felt bad. And they put on this session around trying to get everyone that worked there other jobs elsewhere. Although there may have been other factors that made that this situation worse, which is kind of the environmental aspect of video game development. So on the one hand, this is all very sad. For everyone involved, and I get that, and I've been made redundant more than once, so I know the pain and act. So I'm not coming from a position of, you know, impurity here. I know what it feels like. But these things are the reality of life and specifically business. And that also seems to be what's sadly missing in a good portion of the world of late. Responsibility and cause and effect. Setting up a new company is hard and going straight in as a big studio with a culture and a lifestyle is a red flag to me. 100 plus strong people, staff from the off, put huge pressure on everyone. If you're paying every single one of those people $20,000, $30,000 a year, that's a huge amount of money you've instantly got to fund. That's a huge amount. If you have a longer tail, you end up cutting that cost down. You know, you're spending over a million, $2 million on staff. That's a huge amount of money you're spending just to get the thing spun up. You haven't done anything yet. So that's the first flag to me in terms of it would be it's always best to start as an indie. And I mean true indie. I don't mean the modern indie where companies just pretend they are because they're pixel graphics and everyone falls for the gag. Their website was PR friendly. If you look at it, it's not focused on just delivering a great game that lands strong and makes a solid start and builds from there. As such, they ran before they could walk. And that is the biggest issue many of these companies fall into. Exactly the same thing. Venture capitalists want to come in, they want a quick return, so they overpromise and underdeliver, and there we go. So many caveats and elements like this cause many of these studios, big and small, over the past 12 months, and it'll only get bigger. There's going to be more of these things happening over the, the long period of time. This is what I meant by the Activision deal. When I said, be careful what you ask for, this is where it's headed. Because when you mitigate risk and you consolidate at this level, it leaves little else for anybody else when the market is shrinking. And that's what's happening. This is retraction of the market because it was never as big. It was a fake market growth pushed by terrible accountants basically overpromising and basically getting people's money to fund projects that didn't make any money. That's the point. And as a result of the consolidation, the shrinking market and the greedy shareholders and need for double digit growth and profit all the time, and this is where the Activision buyout came in. And obviously the worst, the most incompetent of all venture capitalists going in embrace of death. 
Having money only gives you choices, but being rich and stupid can be deadly. So Sony, Microsoft, et al. are not stupid. And in the end, you have to know your limitations and partnerships are safer than owning a company. But this startup was likely an indirect reaction to that very buyout of their former company in Activision. And this is exactly what I mean by be careful what you ask for. But the short-sighted vision of we can make a killing here, we're also to blame. Being a veteran in any industry does not mean you're safe or you know it all. And Glenn Schofield made the exact same error with striking distance and Callisto Protocol. But he left, which was likely part of that investor milestone contract also. Basically, he didn't make its returns. And one of the things was, you ain't got a salary anymore, you're out. And he likely didn't get any you know, potential bonus payment that was also wrapped up in that. In the end... What I'm trying to say is many, and I do mean many, many studios, and ultimately people will lose their jobs over the next 12 to 18 months, and greed from everyone involved, or ignorance, arrogance, take your pick, are the real culprit, big and small alike. Now, I think games will be fine overall. It will become smaller, and the sharks, they'll move on to another feast. In the 80s, the bedroom code of the UK, which I knew very, very well, was the perfect storm for this. And in the UK, we've always been big advocates for sole proprietorship or sole traders, which many of the 80s coders were exactly that. The problem now is that inflation and recession makes it a bad market to set up a medium or larger outfit as the cost of lending is now far too high. The perfect model for how to do it right was Ultimate Play the Game, which became rare in 8.5, and that was partly funded by actually selling that very same built-up Ultimate brand to the UK house US Gold. And then they got purchased by Nintendo and then Microsoft. So this is the sole trader dream, the example really of how a small group set up and they make something small but successful. They make good quality products. And like the Darling Brothers and Codemasters, then they expand on that. They create the brand which builds trust, but they stay independent. Then once they become successful, they expand with their own money and safety buffer. Stay privately owned and masters of their own destiny. Work on your own stuff, get some contract work. And once you're looking to retire or move on, then you can get investors and cash in on some of that work. Or like Rare, you can cash out and sell up to a bigger company and walk off into the sunset. And if you're really clever, you do it all over again. And that is what the greats do. It's what Trip Hawkins actually tried to do with EA, with the 3DO, but it failed the second time around. Again, every choice has a risk and a reward and consequence. And we only like to look at it in the games industry, specifically and online, in terms of it should always be reward, it should always be great. That's not how the world works. You have to take the rough with the smooth. The example is me. I critique games, technology, everything else, but I'm open to critique. I get critiqued all the time, and that's absolutely fine. I can't moan, and no one can moan. If you put critique out, you can't then complain that somebody from a games industry or developer critiques you because you've critiqued their stuff and you've got something wrong. That's the nature of the beast. So you've got to take the rough with the smooth. I've been a big advocate for that my whole life. I'm never one of those people that wants people to just treat kid gloves and everything's positive spin, don't like it. In fact, I thrive on critique that's productive. That's what you need. And that's one of the problems that's come from this. People only like to hear good news. They only like to live in an area where they get told they're great, they're perfect, everything's beautiful. That doesn't help anybody, least of all the individual themselves. But much more on this I could discuss on, on hiring practices and how gaming, like movies and music before, it's kind of been hijacked for other reasons. But a smaller, more focused and less hyped and busy game sector sounds great to me. That's what I want. That's what I prefer. That's what I used to love. And I think a lot of it now is kind of this, they've, they've been victims of their own destiny. It's the constant, it's what I said a few years ago about, you know, constantly going on about teraflops, NVIDIA, and resolutions and frame rates. In the end, it's going to catch up with you. Then you have to change the narrative. If you constantly overhype the next big thing, you end up with what the market does now, which is, a game's out a day and everyone's bored and look at the next game that's coming out. So people aren't really spending time with one product. They're looking to, uh, on the horizon all the time. And therefore, you're constantly chasing your tail. The hype train has to keep running, but it runs out of steam at some point. And even now, I see other teams such as Naughty Dog and ID. that they've, People have left them and they're setting up their own company. I think it's called Empty Vessel. Again, that's kind of a name I think that explains the reason why they've done it. But they just make 
X game as demanded. That's really what they've come. So they've been told to make a game, but their their aims aren't that way. They want to make something different, something new. But again, when VCs are involved, we need to take the lowest risk. And we need to make something that the market wants. Or we we just most likely what happens is you, you end up going into a board and they go, oh, I like your idea about that game where a guy runs around in a, in a thong playing guitar. That's great. But let's change it. Let's make it about uh, a guy going out with a gun and a little bit like Call of Duty, but not quite, and a map, and it's a Battle Royale game. That's what happens. Basically, they don't like your idea. They just want to pull, force you down a route to sell something that they want. So that's what happens. And that makes people fall out of love of what they're doing. You know, At the end of the day, game developers, like everything else, they're really passionate artistic types, and they want to create something. And that's hard to do in a corporate factory process machine, which is where a lot of these people will be. That's what happens. When you industrialize stuff to this level, this commercial involvement, Everything becomes about milestones, deliverables, profit, what the market wants, where the growth areas are. You get forced into avenues. You're not creating anymore. You're doing. Um, and it also has a large flux of grifters. <laughs> Let's not lie. People that think it's a perfect job rather than working in my sector, police, pilot, lawyers, whatever, dentists, bricklayers, oil workers. You know, there's lots of jobs out there that can earn money, but it can be more work than doing something easier. And so it can be a magnet to those that don't want to pull their own weight within the team or hide within the team. It's the old idea, you know, ideas people are of 10 a dozen. Deli people that can deliver are what you need. And there's a mix of issues such as kind of poor middle to higher management. Trust me, that's a massive problem. I'm in that level now, but I'm not poor. I, I, I will speak to everyone on all levels. That's one of the reasons why I do well in what I do, because I don't pretend that things are going great. And I don't tell people above me that things are going great or they're not making mistakes or within my team and, and people that I work with, for, and I manage. Because at the end of the day, you have to be honest. Honesty is the best policy because it gets things done. You might have to have awkward conversations as people class them, but I don't. I never do. Um, I'm a big advocate for there's no such thing as bad news, only bad timing. So if you see things coming, you manage risk and you manage dependencies well, you end up having those conversations and you call out you know, bullshit when it happens. That's the most important part. We've lost a lot of that in this industry everywhere across the board. People are very, very volatile to being told you're not doing a good job or you've missed your milestones. There's always... No one says, do you know what, you're right. There's always every reason under the sun. I'm not saying they're not valid, but you have to look at it from the wider picture. If somebody's coming to you and telling you you haven't delivered and you're 12 months late, you shouldn't need them to tell you. You should already know that. And that sometimes comes as a surprise. I've seen that firsthand. I've had conversations with people. I've had to you know, say, well, I'm sorry, this isn't working out. We're going to have to call this project we have to move you out of this this team whatever and i've been giving them reviews i've given them peer reviews i've been giving them feedback i've been giving them reports and they still haven't noticed any of those things even though we've had conversations so i'm aware firsthand how it happens but the way i manage it is by consistently giving that person as much effort and time as i can before it comes to the point where i have to you know put them on a on a controlled process that's where you have to do these things. No one wants to sack anybody. No normal person wants to fire people, shut companies, cut budgets. No one wants to do that at all. But the reality is you have to do that at some point if it's not working out. And we've lost sight of that, I think, in the modern day. We've lost sight of um, corporations are never good. They're never your friend. Let's be honest. No one. But they're also not your enemy. They have a purpose like you. You want to work to earn money, to live a life, to do what you want to do in your personal time with your family, your friends, whatever. A company wants to do the same thing to pair its shareholders. That's the point of its existence. But it's when both parties don't see either view, then you lose the ability to have rational conversation. And that's kind of where we are with, with this situation in terms of we've got a weak management structure that doesn't manage people, doesn't manage expectations. And we've got a workforce that wants to focus on things that are important to delivering. So they're all about their lifestyle or the things they want to say or the things they want to aim at, but they don't want to put the effort in and get things delivered. Um, I'm not saying crunch is good. I'm not saying long hours are good, but I've done them. We've all done them. It's the nature of the beast. You have those moments. And I think they're good so long as they're very small and they have a a finite lifespan that has a target at the end. You can motivate people to do great things if you give them the motivation. That's what we've lost. We've lost the motivation. The carrot is now a stick and a carrot and no one knows what they're chasing. It's their own stick and their own carrot. 
Or worse still, they don't even know which one is the stick and the carrot and therefore motivation's completely fallen down. And it's cohesion. It's getting everyone rallied around the same end point. And again, alongside this, the issues of high turnover or retention issues that also creates a surefire killer to quality and productivity. The, the kind of change in teams, so the, the storming, norming, performing process that all and every team has to go through, big and small. Um, all of that is a surefire killer to productivity and motivation. Good leaders lead by example. I do. I work hard. I put in the effort. I put in loads of hours. I do things. I still code. I still go in, do network and construction service sometimes. I'll still deliver things in the back of a van. I do all those things where I can because I like it. And that's what I think is good. And it endears people to me because they don't see me as this, this guy that's, you know, oh, yeah, you say you've done it, but you've not. I will still walk the walk, talk the talk and do the job. Um, but we have people now that don't that don't want to do that. They come in within a, within a business within six months. They want to be running it. And it's that they're experts in their head. And that is a problem. And I think that comes fundamentally from management. They don't manage people and they don't manage expectations. Again, I've gone off on a bit of a rant there, but. Kind of remote working has made this really, really bad. Um, and let's be honest, it's also the ability to have a lot of people hide, skive, and the huge number of delays and bugs and problems in games and, and software, modern software as a whole, is terrible. And it all makes more sense when you look at it from that point of view. No one wants to make a bad product, but if you don't manage it, it will be a bad product. And I suspect this, the financial costs and impact of UK working, is a big reason Sony decided to close Soho, because... The cost of the pound over here, the inflation rate, the market values of the pound, everything else. It makes financial decisions easier when you can go to other countries that are cheaper, that like it or not, and get the same quality or even better quality for less money. And so I haven't really shipped a game for five years or so. So, And they've always kind of been a gun for hire in terms of supporting wider PlayStation and other teams. So it, again, it kind of makes them... Poor, it's a poor show for creators when you're told to do stuff rather than having the ability to do it yourself. I'm not saying that Sony haven't funded it because Media Molecule have got away with being able to make their own thing for years. But again, they haven't made much money. I'm sure they haven't made much profit. So Sony are not terrible in that sense in terms of funding these companies to be creative because that's what makes PlayStation specific. They allow creative people to be creative. But there's got to be a line in the sand. You know, you can't keep putting money into a black hole and expected it never to come back out again you need something to keep the, the fires burning the lights on so i sadly expect this to continue but hopefully this explains some of the variety of impacts the causes and reasons for why we're seeing the market where we are and how businesses kind of make their decisions how work gets done why people leave companies why people set up companies and what the risks are when that happens i hope that what will happen is there will no longer be this drive to be in the video game market, which was music or art or films or whatever it's been for years. The art focus is important. But you tend to find a lot of successful companies that made things. You'll have a business head and you'll have a technical or an artistic head. Codemaster is a good example of that. Um, and the two brothers, the two darling brothers, one was the businessman, one was the, the, the brains in terms of making the games. That's why that worked, because they had that balance. You need that equilibrium between the two sides. What you've got now is you've got a lot of people that want to create something, but in their own time. Now, if you're a small independent company, you can. But if you're a big company with the milestones and deliverables, you can't. So you can't have both. You can't go and get, you know, 30 million from a big company to set up a company to start it off, to get things working, start a product. And then three years down the line, still not have that ready to ship. That's that's only going to go one way, which is how it's gone. What's happened is the market's caught up with all these people that have been grifting or at least hoping they would deliver something. So the biggest grift going, you know, is Star Citizen, let's be honest. That is crazy how that's not been called into court yet. Uh, it will be, absolutely. It's going to be a corporate example in terms of some lawyer will pick it up, somebody will find somebody and it will go mad. Um, I mean, there's people that have worked on nothing but that game and now left the games industry and the game's not out. So this isn't, what I'm trying to say is this isn't one example. This isn't just one company doing it. It isn't just Sony. It isn't just Microsoft. It isn't just anybody. It's a case of, like the dot-com bubble, there was a huge growth area for people to make a lot of money. And some people have. Some companies have. But I think that ride's come to an end now. And the reason it's come to an end is because of 
overinvestment, uh, overindulgence, and it, and just wildly creative accounting in terms of this market is bigger than it is. The strong ones will survive; they always do. But we are going to see a shrinkage and a and a I think a, a an expansion of the games market. I think I said this before. Uh, I think one of the big things that people go into is mobile gaming. I think it'll get bigger and bigger. In the end, that's the end. I think the end game will always be you'll have a device that does both. You can take it to work, you can plug it in at home, and it'll play the same quality games. I've always said that I think Microsoft will go that way. There's now rumours and rumblings from Phil himself that he's going that way. Sony are definitely heading that way, which is why the PS Portal came out. They're testing the market. Nintendo have never left that area. Um, and I think you'll see a lot more. I think you'll see, like I said before, in 2017, I think you'll see MSI and other companies, Gigabyte, making Xbox consoles with a variety of specs that you can buy and they might not be ones that just plug into your TV. That might be a mobile device. And that keeps the Xbox brand alive. But they'll also make a higher level API overhead that runs Windows and allows them to run all the older games on this newer hardware. And it'll be funded by the fact that the hardware will be more powerful than the Series X. It'll be more powerful than what's on the market. It'll be able to deliver gaming quality that's superior with the abstraction cost that that operating system will have. The Steam Deck, has, I think, has shook up the market in terms of things that can happen. And I think there's a lot of excitement here. So I'm trying to you know, balance what I've just said with a negative, with a positive, which I think the market will change. The gaming industry will change. People will find new avenues, new areas to grow. There'll be new types of games. We'll see a resurgence of other things. And that's why I love PlayStation and even you know, MetaQuest for the VR area and Valve. I love VR. I think it's great. It's one of my favorite areas of the past few years. It's never got to the level it should have done, but hopefully it can still continue to exist in this separate development area that I think games will go in. And that'll be because there'll be less people hungry for profits and it'll be around the passionate people that want to deliver something new and exciting. And that's where the fun comes from. Um, it was like that, I think, up until the late 2000s. And then I think around the PS4 area, it was starting to become quite cookie cutter, boilerplate, conveyor belt delivery. It was all, let's make this, but bigger. Let's make this and a sequel. Let's do a bigger version of this. Let's improve the graphics. And that's all great, but I think you need more than just that. If you look at older games, I've said this before, like Metal Gear Solid 2, or even if you go back to even 8-bit games that use physics and collision, we haven't really innovated in, in those areas anymore. And that's because venture capitalists don't care about that. People who want to make profit don't care about any of that. In fact, most people who run these companies or are involved in it have no interest or involvement in the market itself directly. Nothing new there. That's why you get crap, like music industry. It was taken over and owned by a lot of corporations and they just want to get things out the door. They don't care about passion and art and quality of production and different styles and, and lyrics. They just want something that sells and they can get it across many adverts and TVs and films as possible. Games have gone the same way. So most of the time they look down on you and think, well, what? how can I get more pennies out of those people's pocket that the market we're in? My, me, I'm the market. I play games. I love games. Um, so therefore, a lot of the companies don't see it that way. They see it as how can I maximize my profits, not how can I make the best product? And that's what I hope we get back to. We get back to that focus. Profit, absolutely. Everyone needs profit. Don't deny anyone profit. But the gambling aspect of games is, is one of the biggest problems. Again, not new. Um, gambling was big in the 70s, and 60s, uh, 80s. You know, you had fruit machines that used to pull in arcades. In fact, arcades still only exist in the UK now, predominantly, because fruit machines are still in there. So gambling's a big part of the life. The lottery is gambling. So unfortunately, games were just a, an extension of that. How can we make more money out of a product? I know, let's call it free to play. Um, and then just everything in the game is gambling purchase additional skins you know Fortnite, for example is the probably the worst example of it in terms of profitability uh, and that's kept epic afloat so that is a high level view something i wanted to talk about off cuff just open-ended my, my thoughts my experience what do you think What's your view on the games industry now? What's your view on my thoughts on it? What's your view on the dot-com bubble comparisons, the investment? Where do you think this will go? Are you happy? Are you sad? Do you have any expectations? Leave all your thoughts and comments down below. Remember, if you like what I do here on my independent channel, then you can support me on my Patreon site. There's been more stuff coming up soon in terms of exclusive content, specific stuff around retro and things that I'm very involved in in terms of things that I like and other areas I'm trying to delve into as well. So keep an eye out for that. You can couple of dollars and pounds a month really really helps and it helps me grow what I do in terms of the things on the side again you can watch me over on IGN with my performance reviews but I'll be back very soon with more on this this week actually another video coming up and hopefully we can have more discussions around this kind of area and I'm looking to branch out and bring people onto my podcast 
so that we can start having wider discussions and get more balance than just me rambling into a microphone on a cold, wet Tuesday afternoon. Anyway, I will see you very soon on the next one or over on IGN. Thanks very much for listening. Bye.